welcome back to this edition of the Asia Ventilation Forum's ICU Tips and Tricks podcast. Um, I'm the host today, um, Jeff Palo, and today we are uh, we have Doc, uh, Professor Paul Young, an intensive care specialist at Wellington, New Zealand, um, with and who is also a clinical researcher for intensive care with particular interest in large-scale randomized controlled trials. Um, Dr. Young was one of the main investigators of the ICU ROCKS trial that was published in 2022, uh, sorry, in 2020, that um, talked about the potential dangers of um, oxygen as we were using it here in our ICUs. So in the ICU ROCKS trial, they were looking at conservative versus liberal oxygen therapy and looking at uh, ventilator-free days. So we're going to be talking more about um, oxygen today, which is um, a very common and a lot of people think it's an innocuous therapy, but it looks like we are we need to be titrating it the way that we are titrating maybe our vase suppressors and our inotropic support in our ICUs. So we're learning more about that. And so we are so happy to have uh, uh, Dr. Young with us. Uh, hi, Paul. So uh, thank you hi. very much for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Um, Thanks very much for inviting me, me on to talk about something that I'm passionate about. <laughs> very good. Um, so about oxygen, I know that over the last um, maybe two decades already, they were, they've were they already been talking about the potential dangers of or risks um, to our patients. Could you run us a little background about um, why these kinds of researches are important? What kind of risks are we actually imposing on our patients? When we use yeah, so well, I, I think the whole area of oxygen therapy is really quite an interesting one. Um, and, and really my perspective on it is very much a very much one that spans many millions of years, right? So human beings have evolved to breathe 21% oxygen over millions and millions of years. And, and although we're utterly dependent on oxygen to survive, it is important to kind of remember that fundamentally, oxygen is a highly reactive chemical, which has the potential to damage, uh, you know, DNA and damage lipids and damage cells. And where we have within our cells a, a sort of whole... Um, system for managing um, free radicals that are generated by oxygen. So, you know, in, intrinsically anything that results in us being exposed to more than that 21% oxygen that we've evolved to breathe is a, is a physiological stressor. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the basis by which oxygen can potentially cause harm is pretty simple, right? It's like it's a chemical that is uh, potentially damaging to the cells and the tissues uh, in excess. And so there are a number of different things to think about, right? One is that the amount of oxygen that you breathe is usually 21%. And every time mm -hmm. you're breathing more than 21%, your lungs are being exposed to more oxygen than they're used to. Um, or than they've been evolved to deal with. And, and similarly, you know, every time you end up with an arterial oxygen content that's above normal, then potentially you're ending up with your cells and your tissues being exposed to more oxygen than usual, and that creates oxidative stress. And that potentially has clinical consequences. So I think at a sort of basic philosophical level, it's kind of easy to understand why really liberal provision of oxygen might be bad. And in addition to those sort of cellular kind of um, effects, there's also physiological effects, right? So high levels of oxygen reduce cerebral blood flow, they reduce coronary artery blood flow. Um, and those as well have potential consequences. So I think we've now had quite a lot of 
clinical trials looking at giving a little bit more oxygen or a little bit less oxygen. And I think there are a few things that we can say, and I'm sure we'll talk about a number of the trials in detail, but in general terms, I think we can say that whether you give a little bit more oxygen or a little bit less oxygen probably doesn't have a massive effect on any patient important outcome like whether you live or you die. Mm -hmm. The thing that's, I think, special about oxygen therapy is it's so ubiquitously applied to people who are acutely ill that although we can rule out a really big effect on, on mortality, for example, if you look at all the clinical trials individually, or even when you look at all the clinical trials of a bit more oxygen and a bit less oxygen together, you end up with really quite wide estimates of effect that encompass the possibility of clinically important benefit from a conservative oxygen therapy approach, actually all the way up to clinically important harm from a um, conservative oxygen approach. And so my belief is that for a, a ubiquitous treatment like oxygen, which is just being given to millions and millions of people all of the time, we actually really need to know really precisely, does the amount of oxygen that you give make a difference particularly to whether you live or you die if you're critically ill. But I think it's also important to know, is the amount of oxygen that you give, um, you know, is a, is a different approach better for some patients? Do some patients do better with conservative oxygen therapy and other patients do better with a more liberal approach? Mm -hmm. And at the moment, you know, I think, you can make some educated guesses about that, but we don't have a huge amount of um, concrete evidence to to guide us about what what to do. So those kind of fundamental questions of getting towards understanding whether there are really small treatment effects is something that um, I've been investigating in a trial that's led on from the ICU rocks trial, which is the Mega rocks trial, which is a 40,000 participant um, randomized cl clinical trial being conducted in many countries around the world. And, and uh, if there are people listening into the podcast who are interested potentially in participating in that trial, they should uh, get in touch because 40,000 patients is a lot. Yeah. Oh, so it is already ongoing. Um, the yeah, so, so, so Mega Rocks is already ongoing. Ongoing. In fact, we've got um, fifty over fifty centres around the world participating, um, and uh, we've recently passed six thousand patients enrolled, and we're currently enrolling around about five hundred patients a month, and expecting to get up to um, to around a thousand patients a month by early early next year. Oh, nice. So I guess if so many people are on oxygen, then um, you are going to get a lot of patients. Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a really pragmatic clinical trial. So we, we're essentially just enrolling patients who uh, have unplanned invasive mechanical ventilation in the intensive care unit. So pretty much everyone who requires uh, invasive mechanical ventilation in the intensive care unit, apart from elective surgical patients, are eligible for the trial which we hope will answer the question about the best oxygen regimen overall, but also help us understand whether some patients should be receiving conservative oxygen therapy and other patients should be receiving liberal oxygen therapy. Well, I would like to go back to that later on, um, Megarox and um, some of the other studies that may be coming up. But um, if we could backtrack, I think, to, um, to ICU rocks, um, what, what did your team find during that? Um, study. What did you do? Yeah, so, what did you find? so, um, so the ICU rocks trial was a trial where we looked at patients who were invasively mechanically ventilated and anticipated mm -hmm. to be ventilated beyond the calendar day after randomization. So we tried to look at people who were in the intensive care unit who you thought would require a ventilator for um, some time, and. Um, we randomly allocated them to conservative oxygen therapy or liberal oxygen therapy. 
And really the conservative oxygen therapy, um, the fundamental thing about it was it was about using the lowest amount of oxygen that you could to achieve um, an oxygen saturation that was above a lower limit of, um, of, of safety, really. And, and we, we achieved um, pretty substantial separation between uh, groups, particularly in relation to the amount of time spent breathing room air. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of patients who were invasively mechanically ventilated on 21% oxygen in the conservative arm. And our hypothesis was that conservative oxygen therapy would increase the number of ventilator-free days in patients who um, fulfilled our eligibility criteria. So for ventilator-free days, you, you allocate all the patients who die the worst possible outcome of zero, mm -hmm. and then all of the other patients get 28 minus the number of days that they require ventilation for. Um, so if you're ventilated for 28 days or more, you get zero. And if, you know, if you get less, less than 28 days, you get some, some number. Um, and, and the theory there was, well, well, look, if high levels of oxygen are causing direct pulmonary toxicity, that might mean that people get ventilated for longer. And if the systemic oxygen toxicity is causing um, important effects, then that might result in mortality going up. And so perhaps um, the number of ventilator-free days will be increased by a conservative approach. What we actually found was that uh, the number of ventilator-free days was uh, similar by treatment group. There was no statistically significant difference. And the mortality was also similar by treatment group. But as I sort of alluded to before, the confidence intervals were pretty wide. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing that, that I think was quite important to come out of the IC ROCKS trial was we found um, you know, some evidence of heterogeneity of treatment effect. So in particular, <clears throat> for patients who um, had hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, it did look as though there was a signal of benefit for conservative oxygen therapy. Whereas for patients who had sepsis and also for patients who had acute brain injuries and diseases apart from hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, it actually looked like a liberal approach to oxygen therapy might be better. And so I think that the key things that came from IC Rocks were um, one, we really excluded very large treatment effects on mortality um, or on ventilator-free days from conservative or, or liberal oxygen therapy. And that was quite important because some previous trials, namely the Oxygen ICU trial, which was published in, in JAMA, and the IOTA systematic review, which looked at a number of randomized trials in acutely ill adults, had suggested the potential for a really large treatment effect from liberal oxygen therapy. Um, and so I think the ICU ROCKS trial really refuted those previous trials, but at the same time, um, it certainly doesn't provide um, the last word about which oxygen treatment is better or worse. And it did um, also highlight the possibility that that maybe more oxygen is better for some patients and maybe less oxygen is better for others. Um, so um, would it be fair, for example, for a, let's say in a general population where who are not septic, who are not um, brain injured or are not um, hypoxic, are not post-arrest, for example, um, would it be fair for a clinician like me to say that I would hold these two strategies of conservative and liberal oxygen therapy as equivalent. Um, yeah, I mean, I think personally, I think on the, on the sum total of the evidence that we have at the moment, that is a very reasonable position to take, you know. And so there have been some other oxygen trials since the IC ROCKS trial was published. The most notable was the HOT ICU trial, which... Mm -hmm. Is, is, is a bigger trial than ICU ROCKS, which focused on people with acute respiratory failure and intensive care. 
And that, that also showed broadly similar mortality for the two treatment strategies. So, you know, I think at the moment um, the, that a strategy that results in you having um, a PaO2 of sort of in the range of 60 to 100 millimeters of mercury, anything that puts you in that range is completely, completely reasonable. And maybe for some of these subgroups, like sepsis, it makes a little bit more sense to be closer to the top of the range, even though there's still uncertainty. And for some patients like those with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, it makes sense to be a little bit uh, further to the bottom of the range. Um, but I think actually overall um, that the, the treatment regimens that have been tested in the big randomized controlled trials, they appear to be, be safe. Um, and they do appear to the limits of the evidence, which is, as I've said a few times, you know, pretty wide confidence intervals and, and still imprecision about what the real treatment effects are. Um, as best we can tell, that, that they look like they're the same. Um, there are a few important caveats to make, which is to say, you know, the notion of persistent permissive hypoxemia, that is mm -hmm. aiming for levels of oxygen that are in the blood that are clearly abnormally low. Well, well, those that, that's a thing that hasn't really been evaluated in large scale randomized controlled trials. So that's probably not a great thing to, to do because I, I would view that as an experimental strategy. And strategies that systematically target higher PaO2 than, than sort of 100 or so, th that they probably also fall into the category of experimental. And, and there is one other trial of note, which looked at um, normobaric hyperoxemia for mm -hmm. patients with sepsis, which was stopped early because of a signal of harm. So, uh, you know, I think the really extremes of hyperoxemia and hypoxemia, we should totally avoid those outside the context of an investigation of a, of a clinical trial. So but, what kind of PO2 would be a, a dangerous hyperoxemia? Well, I mean, that's a good question. The, the, the HYPER2S trial looked at giving an FI2 of one, right? So that was actually targeting hyperoxemia, and that was bad. Um, knowing whether or not a PAO2 of, you know, no one knows whether a PAO2 of 150, for example, is actually bad. Um, but I think it's important to say that the treatment strategies that have been evaluated in large scale randomized controlled trials don't target a PAO2 of 150, or at least even if they intended to target that, that's not what they actually achieved, right? So Mm -hmm. um, I think that really those, the, the PAO2 values of, of more than sort of 100 to 120 are getting into the realms of clearly you're exposing people then to abnormally high levels of oxygen. And there's no particular rationale for doing that no, we um, in usual clinical practice at the moment. So I would sort of say, you know, that I, I wouldn't advocate that as a strategy. I think that looking at sort of aiming at a PAO2 of sort of 60 to 100 makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and that probably means for most people targeting on pulse oximetry, something like a saturation of between 92 and, and 97 or 92 and 96 or something like that. That should mm -hmm. give you a reasonable degree of confidence that for most patients, you're not exposing them to dangerous levels of hypoxemia and you're also not exposing them to dangerous levels of hyperoxemia. I ask this question because I find that a lot of people, uh, you can hear a sigh of relief when their uh, patients have a PO2 of around 150, 200, yeah. because they're thinking, oh my gosh, at least um, where oxygen is or hypoxia is not a problem today. But yeah. um, clearly we, we need to be careful in the on the higher end. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I guess 
I guess the arguments for targeting a, a PaO2 that's at the upper range of normal, and clearly, you know, 150 or 200 is not the upper range of normal. That's abnormally high. Yes. But but the arg arguments for being a little bit more liberal, uh, I mean, that obviously gives you a greater margin of safety and a greater margin of error um, in the event that something happens to cause hypoxemia to happen, right? Um, and so, you know, I think, whether that strategy is a, is a good one or not is hard to be hard to be sure. But I think at the moment, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we, I don't think that that we could really advocate that as a strategy because we haven't evaluated it to know that it's safe. And on the basis of the basic biology, there is quite a a sound reason for believing that exposing people to those PaO2 levels of sort of 150 or 200 is, is going to be harmful because it's abnormal. So if, um, let's say, we have been talking about PO2 and sometimes you've been talking about pulse ox, and um, obviously there's the hemoglobin dissociation curve there. Um, if I had to choose between two targets, let's say in the blood gas, I have the PO2 and the SAT at the same time, would I be um, prioritizing the PO2 or prioritizing the SAT? Yeah, you mean prioritizing the SAO2? or The, the SAO2, the... yes. Yeah. That's what I, mean. I mean, look, in my own practice, I, I focus far more on what the SAO2 is than, than what the PAO2 is. And indeed, if the SAO2 is, is okay, then I, I would generally not worry too much about, about what the PAO2 is. That's my own personal approach. I mean, I think one thing that um, is true in every setting, right, is, is actually that the parameter that you're monitoring the most closely is the pulse ox. Pulse ox, right. And, and um, that's the one that's the continuously monitored parameter. And so most of the time, you know, in my practice, the oxygen is being titrated up and down based on what the pulse oximeter says. Um, an important thing to understand there is that there can be a discrepancy between the pulse oximeter and the saturation on the blood gas. So I think whilst you should, I think, you know, titrate oxygen up and down based on what the um, pulse oximeter shows, I think that if you you sort of in a position where you down titrate the oxygen aggressively to get it low and you and you've got a sort of um, SpO2 reading that's in the low 90s, say, that you should get a blood gas to make sure that the SaO2 and the SpO2 agree. And if they like don't, a recalibration. Agree, if they don't agree, then you should follow what the SaO2 shows. Right. Mm. Um, and there are certainly some data that, that suggests that one of the things that might be an important determinant of um, you know, the limits of agreement and the bias and the pulse oximetry is this patient's skin tone. So I think particularly yes. when the skin tone is dark, it's really important to make sure that um, that the pulse oximeter is not deceiving you. So it is important to get um, a, a blood gas when you've made a major change to the oxygen or when there's been a major change to the saturation to make sure that the patient's not being exposed inadvertently to hypoxemia. Thank you. That was a very, very important point about the pulse oximetry in skin tone. Um, I did have another question about, um, we were talking about um, different patient subpopulations which may have um, may benefit or be harmed by certain oxygen targets. Um, what if you've got a patient, and I'm just picking your brain here, um, has two of those problems. For example, a someone who's post-cardiac arrest that got septic at the same time. Um, yep. Which kind of target would you choose for that kind of patient? Would you choose the lower one to protect their brain or the higher one to protect them or the higher one because a septic patient may benefit from a more liberal threshold. Yeah. So so I mean that this is a this is a great question. And and 
I might actually take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the Megarox trial, because that's one of the things that we kind of confronted in the design of the trial, right? Ah. So the Megarox trial is a randomized controlled trial, but it is kind of, it's a little bit different from your average randomized controlled trial, because patients in the Megarox trial can all be allocated to either liberal oxygen or conservative oxygen. And the allocation is determined by randomization, right? Like flipping a coin. Mm. But the difference in the Megarox trial compared to many randomized controlled trials is that the Megarox trial has an element of adaptive randomization. So the coin gets weighted in favor of the oxygen therapy regimen that looks like it's best for the patient who's got the specific problem um, that you're looking after. Right, so they still get randomized, but if it's a patient with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and it looks like on the basis of the patients who've been enrolled already, that patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy actually do better with a conservative oxygen therapy regimen, then the patient will be slightly more likely to be randomized to receive conservative oxygen therapy. And so one of the elements of the trial design is that essentially every patient who gets enrolled benefits from the data that have accumulated from the patients that came before them. And every patient who's enrolled provides data that um, informs the randomization ratio for the patients who come after them. Right? So, um, the situation of what to do if a patient has more than one subgroup, falls into more than one subgroup, is in fact an issue that we confronted when we designed the study. And what we decided that we would do is we would create a hierarchy that was based on the size of the treatment effect. So, if you've got a patient who's got, um, let's just say that you've got a patient who's had a cardiac arrest and has sepsis. And let's just say on the basis of the accumulated data so far that less oxygen looks like it's better for cardiac arrest and more oxygen looks like it's better for sepsis. Well, what happens then is that the thing that determines which of those subgroups is the highest one in determining the randomization ratio is the size of the apparent treatment effect. So if it looks like the treatment effect for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is the largest, mm -hmm. that is the number needed to treat with conservative oxygen therapy to save one life is smallest with... Uh, in that subgroup, then the patient's randomization ratio will be determined by the con that, that condition, right? So the patient with sepsis and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy under that, um, you know, description that I've just made would be allocated preferentially to conservative oxygen therapy. You know, that's just the way that we have... Uh, tackled it within the clinical trial. And so in my practice, what I do is I enroll every patient who I see in my intensive key unit into the <laughs> Megarox trial, and, and I allow their randomization um, to be informed by the data that have accumulated in the trial. Um, you know, what you should do if you're not participating in the trial? Well, I mean, I think you can do whatever you think um, is the most appropriate and you can reassure yourself that we know on the basis of the trials that we have that that range from 60 to 100 of PaO2 sat sort of 92 to 96 or 97 um, on a pulse oximeter appears to be safe uh, and is reasonable for most patients and if you want to come up with a rationale for why the patient in front of you should have one of those approaches or the other, then all power to you. I think that's completely reasonable and fine. Is there still time to enroll with, with your group? 
Ab absolutely, um, yeah. So, so um, you know, as I sort of said to, earlier on, we need 40,000 patients. There's a lot of patients. So we've still got 34,000 patients to go. The clinical trial is really, really easy. Um, and we're absolutely committed to having um, a collaborative international network of intensive cares that is as broadly representative as possible participating in this trial, right? So we've currently got um, intensive cares randomizing patients in Australia, New Zealand, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, um, Nepal, Pakistan, Japan, um, Canada, Ireland. We're soon to be starting also in Oman. We're soon to be starting in Brazil and um, also in, in Italy. And um, we've really designed this trial to be really simple to do, simple to implement. And um, I, I think that the more broader, the broadest geographical representation we can achieve, um, the better, because then we're going to provide data that are informative for people practicing all, all around the world. So if there's anyone you know, listening into the podcast who thinks that they'd be interested in participating in this clinical trial, then they should totally get in touch with me. Um, send me an email and we'll do what we can to 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 sort it out. It's um it's totally it's totally doable. Um actually I forgot to say we're doing the, the trial in Malaysia as well and recruiting well there. So nice. we do have pretty broad representation and um and it's a pretty easy trial to get up and running if if you want to. And uh, you can also rest assured that your your contribution will be be acknowledged um, because uh, we're very much trying to um, create a, a network that um, uh, provides equitable representation from all of the places that that participate. This is very exciting because. Um... When I first started hearing about adaptive um, trials, trial designs, um, well, this is the first one that I've uh, actually heard the methodology with real clinical cases. So um, at during the time that we publish this um, on YouTube and Spotify, we'll be including links to um, to get to you. Yeah, besides, that's, um, great. that's great. Besides um, information about the uh, the topics or uh, links towards the uh, the studies and topics that we have already discussed, yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess the other thing to say is that there are there are a number of sort of short videos on on YouTube about the Mega Rocks trial and the methodological details and so on. And so, if people want to know a little bit more about the Mega Rocks trial. Um, then a reasonable place to start will be just to have a look at those those videos okay. and have a look at the videos and they think it sounds like something that might be possible to do in their intensive care unit, then 100% get in touch and we'll do what we can to support that. Okay, we will link to those two. Well, um, I think that we have actually discussed quite a lot today and um, I learned a lot. Um, things that I'm going to be using in my ICU today since we had been um, rounding this morning and um, I was actually pointing out to um, my students um, how many people were sitting in our ICU with 100% sat, and um, that may not be the best um, strategy to follow. Um, so do you have other um, or final words for our listeners, Professor Young? No, look, I, I mean, I, I think my, my main message would be that I, I think that there's still a lot to learn about oxygen. And I think it's really important that people keep an open mind about what, what the best strategy is. I mean, I think we have seen over the last, you know, I guess 10 years or, or so, an increased realization um, that liberal approaches to oxygen may not be beneficial, but, but actually we still don't know. And it is actually possible that at the end of all of this work, we're going to find out that um, providing oxygen liberally is actually the best thing to do after all. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, 
I would encourage people to, you know, keep an op open mind about what the best approach is and, um, you know, we'll see where the evidence takes us. Well, thank you very much. Professor. No worries. Thanks again for uh, having me on. It's been really, it's been great. So again, this has been a AVF Tips and Tricks, ICU Tips and Tricks podcast. We had with us um, Professor Paul Young of Wellington, New Zealand. And um, thank you very much for listening, everybody. <laughs>